five. Let me tell you. It's good to be alive. Let's just have a little prayer first. Lord, I thank the Lord for his great goodness for sparing me to be here with my family and you're my family, but more so for the praise of his glory. Since that hospital experience, I'm carrying a burden that I feel I must be shared. Something I experienced while lying unresponsive on that life support machine, what I saw in my spirit and at the time has had a profound impact on me and remains as vivid today as it was. So Lord, this morning as I stand before you, let this testimony be that I don't add to it or take away, O Lord. For everything that it is, O Lord, is to bring glory and honor unto your holy and blessed name. In the name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. Just to give you a, <clears throat> a bit of insight, this book is a book of prophecy. It tells you from the beginning to the end what's coming. And we look at the past is history. It's a book of the present and it's a book of the future. Um, as we read this book and we see the news that's coming on, we see the rumors of wars and the is wars and we see that but it's already been predicted we hear of famines earthquakes pestilence diseases all these things has been predicted but the question is are we listening to what the spirit is saying to the church And we can go down and he tells us about false teachers, false prophets. He tells us all these things. And why I'm speaking on this before I give testimony, because this is part of what the testimony is about, is false teachers, false prophets, and a delusion of people that's listening to them. And they're not listening to what the Spirit's saying and what God is saying to them. With me being a traveler, this is part of, of what happened amongst the travelers as well as ordinary churches. There's a fellow called Davy Jones. He's president of Life and Light Missions of the Travelers Movement for the churches up and down. I'm telling you this because Part of this testimony is about Davy and, and the travelers, but it's also to make it easier for me to illustrate what's happening generally in the churches of Jesus Christ today. Davy lives in Birmingham, and he's got a son-in-law called Roy Dedman, and his mum and dad lives in Birmingham as well. But on the Sunday, the week after I'd come out of hospital, and on the early Monday morning, about, about 4.30 it was, I was praying and talking to the Lord. I said, if you want to speak, for me to speak to Davy Jones, Lord, and tell him this testimony, I said, you'll have to fetch Davy to me. Because I said, it's, I won't be able to go to Davy. And you know what the weather was like then. It, there were motorways and everything was blocked. But on the Sunday, Roy had moved his caravan from Birmingham. He'd moved it to Doncaster. Unknowns to me, on the Monday, Roy took ill with his stomach and they rushed him to hospital. And that afternoon and that day on Monday, Roy's mum and dad and Davy came through 
to Doncaster. My son Matt was down on where Roy's caravan was and he went to see Roy's wife, they call her Lucy. I've known the people all my life. And when there was there, and Matt went into Lucy's trailer, or Roy's trailer, David said, where's your mum and dad's at? He said, take me round. So Matt brought him round to my house from Birmingham. That alone is the power of God. Because apart from Roy going into hospital, Roy also got healed in hospital. Can you just get me that bottle of water down there? And the testimony I shared with Davy. This is what I saw, and this is what God spoke to me on. When I was in the coma, I seemed to be transported, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. I came to sort of a base like a platform from where the Lord took me in different directions. First of all, I seen a hull of a ship and it was an old fashioned ship like the Mary Celeste, that type of thing. And I could see bodies and that laid up and down it and round it. But when I went through the hull of it, there was a brilliant light. But as I went into this light, how far I went down this tunnel, I don't know. But there was a voice spoke to me. It was not like John who saw the Lord and heard the voice. I just heard his voice. And the Lord said to me, I am the Lord that judges. I had no question of who he was. I said, you are worthy to judge me, for your judgment of me will be just and true. And I stood before the Lord naked in one aspect. Everything that I'd ever done was laid bare before him. And I had no excuses. There was nobody there to, I could blame. Because each and every one of us is an opportunity. And we have a choice. Whether we come to church or we don't go to church. But next, the Lord transported me back to where I was before. But this time, there was total chaos on the earth. Now, on reflection, I've asked several ministers, this maybe could be World War III. I don't think for one moment it's Armageddon, but I do believe it could be World War III. And I couldn't see any authority. Everyone was struggling for power. Gangs. Politicians. Leaders, even religious leaders, was all juggling for power. Their own authority. And I saw some of them arguing over a jacket. Over possessions. They were, but they were of no worth because there was no value in the money. Everything had collapsed. 
There was an abomination in the streets before the Lord. The Lord showed me armies fighting with one another. Young men, young women taking people into alleyways, killing them at random and running away laughing. But Paul tells us of a time of great delusion and chaos which is to come. And our people will believe a lie. We can read that in Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And I said unto the Lord, what about my people? And instantly, he showed me an housing estate and caravans or trailers, whichever way you want to pronounce it, going through the estate. And at the side of it was an enormous field. And a marquee, or we call them tents, was being put up. And the Lord said, I give the great commission to Davy Jones to take the gospel to all nations and to make disciples, but instead he preached another gospel. See, you can set off right and be correct, but sometimes we become re religious dustbins because we pick other things up that looks good to us, but it's not good to the Lord. And they become arrogant, conceited. They were ministers fighting amongst themselves and taking one another to court. They become liars, cheats, false leaders, false prophets. And in, their, in, in, in them was no true repentance to continue to do the same thing. And that's happening throughout the churches, through Christendom now. You hear of people, ministers, wanting body, bodyguards. A man of God that needs a bodyguard to protect him. Have you heard of such rubbish? Yet these people have thousands and thousands of followers. And they believe in a lie. Blessed, I bless the leaders of this work because through them I wanted to bless the nations but they didn't want to share the blessing. I shared this with Davy and I told him all these things that we already knew what was coming. I said to him, I said, you already know this, what's happening in the church, Davy. Yet, we still do the same things. They're doing the same things over and over again. Instead, they become proud in themselves and who they are. In ministers, like peacocks, wanting people to worship them and not Jesus. And they use, and they become materialistic minded, legalistic. They were putting power onto people. If you didn't think, and you thought out of the box, you was chucked out. You see religions, you see movements, and these become, through that, they become cults. Nothing else, but they become cults, because the people have no freedom. But whom the Lord set free is free indeed. 
We're not under bondage. We've been set free from that. They become legalistic minded. Travelers in my house and become materialistic minded and legalistic. They use my house as a parade ground or a catwalk, whichever is more appropriate at the time. The ministers' wives, daughters, and congregation dress like harlots, bringing, re bringing no reverence into my house. The word harlot is a very powerful word. And it's mostly used in the Old Testament because God uses that word. And he used it against Israel. When Israel prostituted herself against other gods and started worshipping other gods and they had idols before them. We haven't got to take misunderstand the word harlot, what it means. It's a very powerful and it's to bring the church back into the, the realm of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to want to stand that it's his word and his word alone that brings redemption, salvation, grace, mercy. And they have no reverence in my house. The Lord went into his house. And we read it in the Bible when he cleared it all out for the money lenders. He said, you're a house full of thieves. He was very upset. He took a whip. And he started to beat his house. He said, my house will be a house of prayer. He never said it might be a house of prayer. He said it will be a house of prayer. The leadership is left with blood on their hands, but whether they believe that or not, it is up to them. The Lord asked me, where are my shepherds? And he added, you have a lot of ministers but no ministry. Man can appoint man, but there is only one who can give ministries. Am I not God? Do I not bless who I bless and curse who I curse? They have started to follow man and the movement, but not me. 90% of the church congregation are not saved. This is not my words. This is God's words. My children are the true brethren, for they follow my gospel. They don't vary to the left, they don't vary to the right. They just follow what's in. And if you get anything, God will confirm what he is saying. That's why this is a book of prophecy. This is why he, he, he's laid this out so we can walk with him. If we go outside of this realm, we're not walking with God. And my children are the true brethren. It's brethren, that means men and women. It's not just men. For they follow my gospel. Not only does scripture show very clearly that Christ alone bestows, bestows gifts of ministry to build up the body. He gives some to be teachers, some to be pastors, some to be evangelists, and so on. We can read that in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. But ministries, ministers are called upon to warn the people of the wrath to come. If they do not, their blood will be upon their heads. I just want to read a little bit in 
Ezekiel, if I can find it. My problem is finding the... If this was my wife, she could find it straight away. Because she'll be sitting there saying, I know where it is. And how, how thick can you be if you've been reading your Bible? In Ezekiel 3, 17 down to 18, the Son of Man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him, or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked ways, then he may live. That wicked man shall die in his iniquities, but his blood I will require at your hands. And this is what it is. If we don't speak out, you get a lot of people in churches and these people know what's right and wrong but they just go along with the flow and they don't speak out how can the Lord present you before his father if you don't speak out to tell the world or the church in general where you are, what's going on and what's wrong? Or do you just sit there, deaf, dumb and blind, and you don't want to know, I'm all right, Jack, I read me Bible. But are you all right? And as the Lord lifted me away, I turned and looked back. And I saw the people who were totally isolated and separated from people everywhere. False religions, false movements that doesn't follow the Lord are separated from the body of Christ. They have nothing whatsoever to do with it. And I look back, and the Lord took me back to the chaos, the fighting, the pillaging, the rapes, the armies were fighting one another in battle. And they began to kill their own people. Armies, the smoke, the stench must have been unbearable. There was thousands of bodies laid up and down. Millions of bodies, matter of fact. Being unable. But I couldn't smell anything. I was only looking at these scenes. In the midst of all this was a big signpost. It said north, south, east and west. Why that signpost or that, I don't actually know, but this is all in my own theory. The Lord was showing us that the armies are coming from all the four corners of the earth to fight. And it all this time I was trying to see a date or a sign, something to give me an indication of the date and time where I was. I saw some cars there. I like the cars what we see today. Besides the signpost was a big sign, like a big, like a big board or something to that effect. And on it, it said, World Globalization.
and the Lord showed me a massive lean-to. 50, probably 50, maybe higher. And it went on for a tremendous long way. It went on to me for miles, what I could see of it. And there were millions upon millions and millions of dead bodies inside in different uniforms. The Lord said a gulf, but I put quarry down here because it's, it was more realistic for me to want to stand the word quarry. Beside it, there was a giant earth moving, moving machine. And there was a figure that jumped into the machine <clears throat> and he started to push the bodies into the quarry and it went on and on and it was awesome it had a profound effect on me for two or three days afterwards I couldn't even speak about it I could mumble about it but the effect was tremendous of what's coming and this is what the Lord showed me is what's coming and how we as Christians including myself more so how we should stand before the Lord and they started to push the bodies millions of them then I saw a figure he had dark eyes something like an Arab outfit an headdress. And I said to him, are you the Lord? Why I said that, I don't know. Maybe when we're standing before the Lord before, and maybe that was in my mind, I don't know. And he said, yes, I am. And I looked at him again and said, you can't be God. He said, why can't I be God? I told him because I'm made in God's image and I'm born again and didn't and I don't look like you I said and I'm covered by the blood then I asked him again who are you and these are the words he said to me because he had to answer me true. He said, I'm the great deceiver. And he's the one that brings that separation, that causes that little bit of separation. He's so subtle and he's so clever but sometimes we don't even need the devil in the church to upset the church. We've got people who will already do that. I don't mean here, but I've seen it happen. Then he said to me, the road is narrow, but the gate is narrower, and only a few will get in. We see that in Matthew 7.13. And he showed me a big iron gate, solid iron. When he opened it, there was a furnace type, massive furnace, heat, tremendous. And he was beckoning me to come down. But I went down and in the heat and the thing, it didn't touch me. It reminded me of Daniel when he was chucked into the pit, into the furnace. And when he, he opened, there was a furnace beyond it, was millions and millions of people walking into the furnace, walking into hell. It was as though they knew where they were going but they didn't care. 
Once again, this is what the Lord said, 90% of the congregations in the churches are not saved because of false teachers, false prophets. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ himself, Warn that not even prophesying, casting out demons in his name is a guarantee of entrance into the presence of God. We see that with the ten versions. Five was ready, five wasn't. Five was believers. Listen to this one. Five was believers. The other five was worship of God. They've only give seventy percent. God wants it all. He wants to be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings of your life and my life. And we can only do that through commitment to Him. Then I said to the Lord, Give my old brain a rest. Please, for I'll go anywhere and do anything you want me to do. Then I felt conscious of my body. And I opened my eyes then. But just to finish off here, some six weeks or eight weeks prior to this operation, subsequent events, I came to the point of having to ask myself where I stood with the Lord. I even shared a bit with Dave on this. And I shared with Dave Gerard, because it's Dave Gerard went through this as well as me. Because sometimes we can carry things with us, even stemming from our childhood. For weeks I cried unto the Lord with great repentance, asking the Lord for a deep place within him I took time out to do this, whether the Lord was preparing me for what was coming, I don't know. But I experienced a deep cleansing and strengthening of the Spirit. All this has shown me that we must come back to the basic principle of what the Bible is all about, what the Lord has given us and who he, he is. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. He didn't say separate from the brethren. All his redeemed ones are one body. And to know the blessing of what this means, we must come back to unity in the Lord Jesus as he is Ed and he is the Lord of his church. Amen. David.